Welcome to track two of the audio book, The Little Prince by Antoine de saint Exupery. My name's Tori Favreau and this is a Patreon exclusive. Let's get into it. I hope that you enjoyed the first track. Each day I learned something about the little prince's planet, his departure from it, his journey. The details came very slowly in the course of conversations. So it was on the third day that I learned about the terrible Baobabs. Once again, this time I had the sheep to thank. For abruptly, as if seized by grave doubt, the little prince demanded, It is true, isn't it, that sheep eat small bushes? Yes, it is true. Good, I'm glad. I could not see why it was so important that the sheep should eat small bushes. But the little prince added, Then it follows that they also eat baobabs? I reminded the little prince that baobabs are not small bushes, but trees the size of churches, and that if even he took a whole herd of elephants home with him, they would not succeed in dispatching a single baobab. The idea of the herd of elephants made the little prince laugh. They would have to be stacked on top of each other, then he observed wisely enough. Baobabs before they grow big. Start off small. So they do, but why do you want your sheep to eat up the baby baobabs? He merely replied, oh, come, come, as if it went without saying, and I had to make a great mental effort to work out the problem on my own. In effect, they were on the little prince's planet, as on every planet, good plants and bad plants, and consequently there were good seeds from good plants and bad seeds from bad plants. But seeds, as everyone knows, are invisible. They sleep in the secrecy of the earth until one of them suddenly decides to wake up. So it stretches itself and timidly at first, extends toward the sun a ravishing, innocent little shoot. If this happens to be a sprig of radish or the beginnings of a rose bush, you can leave it to grow wherever it wishes. But if it turns out to be a bad plant, you must root it up at once, the very instant that you recognize it. Now there were some terrible seeds on the little prince's planet, namely those of the baobab tree. The soil of the planet was infested with them, and a baobab, if you tackle it too late, can never be got rid of afterwards. It clutters everything. It will bore right through a planet with its roots. And if the planet is too small, and if the baobabs are too numerous, they will finally make the planet explode. It's a question of discipline, the little prince informed me later on. When you finish washing and dressing each morning, you must carefully wash and dress your planet. You must force yourself to pull up the baobabs regularly as soon as they can be distinguished from the rose trees, which they resemble so closely in early youth. It's very tedious work, but it's very easy. And one day he suggested that I set about making a beautiful drawing so as to give children on my planet a clear idea of all this. Then if one day they travel, he said, that will be of use to them. Sometimes one can safely put off what needs doing until later. But in the case of the Baobabs, it always ends in disaster. I knew a planet that was inhabited by a lazy fellow. He neglected three little bushes, and guess what happened? So following the little prince's directions, I have made a drawing of that planet. I don't much like adopting the tone of a moralist, but the peril of Baobabs is so little understood, and the risks run by anyone who strays onto an asteroid are so considerable, that for once I will break my usual reserve and say categorically, Children, beware of baobabs. It is to warn friends of a danger that they have skirted unknowingly for too long, as I myself have done, that I have worked so hard at this drawing. The lesson I had to pass was worth the trouble it cost me. Perhaps you are asking yourselves why there are no other drawings in this book as magnificent as the baobab drawing. The answer is quite simple. I tried with the rest but did not succeed. When I drew the baobabs, I was driven on by a sense of urgency. Ah, little prince, so it was gradually that I came to understand your melancholy little life. For a long time, your only pleasure had been to watch the gently setting sun. I learned this new detail on the morning of the fourth day when you said to me, I'm very fond of sunsets. Let's go this moment and look at a sunset. But we will have to wait. Wait for what? Wait until it's time for the sun to set. At first, you seemed very taken aback. Then you laughed at yourself and said, I still keep thinking I'm at home. Just so. For as everyone knows, when it's noon in the United States, the sun is setting over France. If you could get to France in a twinkling, you could watch a sunset right now. Unfortunately, France is rather too far away. But on your tiny little planet, 
little prince. You only had to move your chair a few steps. Then you could watch Nightfall whenever you liked. One day you said, I watched the sunset 43 times. And a little later you added, you know that when one is sad, one can get to love the sunset. Were you that sad then on the day of the 43 sunsets? But the prince made no answer. On the fifth day, thanks to the sheep as always, the secret of the little prince's life was finally revealed to me. Without preamble, as though voicing a louder problem he had long meditated in silence, he abruptly asked, If a sheep eats small bushes, will it therefore eat flowers? A sheep eats everything in its path, even flowers with thorns? Yes, even flowers with thorns. So what's the use of thorns? I did not know the answer. At that moment, I was busy trying to unscrew a bolt that had got stuck in my engine. I was very worried, for my breakdown was beginning to look fairly serious, and the low reserves of drinking water made me fear the worst. So what's the use of thorns? The little prince never gave up on a question once he'd asked it. I was irritated with my bolt, so I said the first thing that entered my head. Thorns are of no use whatsoever. They're simply a flower's way of being spiteful. Oh... There was a silence. Then he retorted with a kind of bitterness. I don't believe you. Flowers are weak. They're naive. They reassure themselves as best they can. They think they're being frightening with their thorns. I made no answer. At that moment, I was saying to myself, if this bolt resists any longer, I'm going to knock it out with the hammer. The little prince interrupted my thoughts once more. But as for you, you think that flowers... Not at all. Not at all. I think nothing... I told you the first thing that entered my head. As for me, I happen to have serious matters to attend to. He stared at me in amazement. Serious matters? He looked at me, hammer in hand, fingers black with grease, bent over some machine that seemed to him merely ugly. You are talking like a grown-up. This made me feel a little ashamed, but he continued relentlessly. You are confusing everything. You are mixing up everything. He was truly very angry. He was shaking his golden locks in the breeze. I know a planet where a certain purple-faced gentleman lives. He has never inhaled the scent of a flower. He's never looked at a star. He's never loved anyone. He has never done anything except for add up figures. And all day long, just like you, he repeats to himself, I am a serious person. I am a serious person. And this makes him swell up with pride. But he's not a man. He's a mushroom. What? A mushroom. The little prince was now quite pale with anger. For millions of years, flowers have been growing thorns. For millions of years, sheep have been eating flowers nonetheless. And it, is it not a serious matter to try to understand why flowers go to such trouble producing thorns that will never be of any use to them? Is it not important, the war between sheep and flowers, is it not more serious and more important than the calculations of a fat, red-faced gentleman? And if I personally know a flower, which is unique in the world, which exists nowhere except on my planet, but which one little sheep can destroy in a single bite, just like that, one morning without even noticing what he's doing, well, I suppose that too is of no importance. He flushed and then continued, if someone loves a flower of which there is only one example among all the millions and millions of stars that is enough to make him happy when he looks up at the night sky, he says to himself, somewhere out there is my flower. But if a sheep eats the flower, it's as though all the stars have suddenly gone out. But I suppose that, too, is of no importance. He could not say any more. His words were choked by sobbing. Night had fallen. I'd let my tools drop to the ground. I no longer cared a fig for my hammer or my bolt or about thirst or about dying. On one star, one planet, this planet, the earth, there was a little prince in need of consoling. I took him in my arms. I cradled him. I told him, the flower you love is not in danger. I'll draw a muzzle for your sheep. I'll draw you a shield to put around your flower. I'll... I did not really know what to say. I felt like a blundering idiot. I did not know how to reach him, where to catch up with him. It is such a secret place, the land of tears. And that concludes the second file, the second part of The Little Prince. I hope that you're enjoying this and we'll be up with part three soon.
Thank you so very much, guys. I do appreciate everything you're doing. And I hope that you're getting genuine joy from listening to this story.